Hi all and welcome to episode 53 of Brain Speaking Sanjeev. I'm recording this episode in my car, waiting in a parking lot. I thought it's a good way to put this time into some use. I want to talk to you today about the Boeing 747. I wrote an article two days ago which came out in the Mumbai Mirror. I had only 800 words so I really could not do it the justice that I wanted to do. But the 747, as uh, most of you know, is uh, close to retirement. Most airlines in the world have decided to ground the fleets, those that were still operating them, the latest being uh, British Airways. And today, Qantas flew their last 747 flight out of Sydney to LA. And on the way out, they traced out the, the shape of the kangaroo symbol of Qantas, uh, which is viewable through Flight Radar 24. So it was a wonderful little gesture. But the whole world is getting very sentimental and emotional about the 747 because it changed the world of air travel. Uh, it was phenomenal and I just want to look back into the period in which it was designed and built. So this was uh, back in 1965 when Juan Tripp, uh, the, the main force behind Pan Am, he wasn't really the founder even though he's considered to be the founder, he actually was one of the very early investors in Pan Am. But he then became the, the main driving force behind the airline. So Juan Tripp and Boeing used to have a very unique relationship where uh, Juan would tell Boeing what his requirements were and would really push them to, you know, do new stuff, do more risky and more daring stuff. And it worked very well for for both companies. Uh, Boeing designed for Juan Tripp and for Pan Am the flying clippers, the flying boards that uh, really revolu revolutionized uh, air travel back in the 1930s and 40s. Juan Trip was also behind uh, much of the design of the 707, the first commercial, commercially successful long-range jet airliner. And then uh, when 1965 came about, Juan Trip went to uh, Bill Allen of Boeing and said that I want an aircraft that is basically three times as large as the 707, which can fly non-stop between New York and London, and I want it ASAP, I want it within three years. So this was 1965 and you've got, uh, you know, you don't even have computers in those days. You don't, pocket calculators were fairly rare. Uh, you had less computing power in the space missions that were taking place then than you have in the average uh, smartphone today. But the world was a very different place back in the 60s. There was a huge can-do attitude. There was a huge, you know, we're going to try, we're going to take risks, we're going to change the world attitude. The Beatles were raining the radio waves. Uh, supersonic flight was being uh, designed then, the Concorde design started back then, Boeing 2707 started behind then. And uh, you know, and people didn't want to take no for an answer. People wanted to push the envelope and John Kennedy, the US president, had very famously said, had challenged the uh, NASA that uh, put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, so by the end of 1969. So this was the atmosphere in which uh, the 60s operated. Of course, at the same time, there was a Vietnam War, which uh, the U.S. was involved in, which was a very, very uh, brutal war. And there was a lot of uh, anti-war protests going on in the U.S. and around the world. There was a whole hippie movement and flower power and, uh, you know, so there was a lot happening. It was a very, very tumultuous, yet very innovative period where a lot of the old ideas gave way to new. So anyhow, so in this um, in this environment, Juan Tripp came to Bell Island in 1965 and said that I want an aircraft that is three times the size, or almost three times the size of the 707. I wanted to fly non-stop between New York and London. Now the 707 that time had a capacity for about 140, 250 people. He wanted an aircraft that had 350 to 400, and he wanted uh, a range that was unheard of earlier. And even engines didn't exist to power such a large aircraft, and he wanted this in three years. And the f fascinating thing is that uh, Boeing took on the challenge. Uh, the lead engineer on the project, Joe Sutter, who's known as the father of 747, uh, was given charge of the project and officially the project was given a go ahead in 1966 February. And 28 months from that date, 28 months from 1966 Feb, when they didn't even have a uh, the first drawing, they actually finished the design of the 747 and within three years of 66, by 1969, the aircraft flew. Now to think about the phenomenal you know, effort that this took, the 747 has 6 million parts in it. Out of the 6 million parts, 3 million are fasteners, rivets and fasteners. It has about 300 kilometers of wiring in the aircraft. And uh, it was designed to a scale that had never been built before. It's a, it's, uh, it's a semi-double-deck aircraft. The front of the aircraft, has, as you all know, has a raised uh, cockpit and a lounge and what later became a seating area behind it in the bubble. 
uh, and uh, base uh, the flaps if you see the the trailing flaps of the 747 uh, right up to the 400 were huge immense complex it had 18 wheels I mean nothing of this scale had ever been attempted before and these guys designed the aircraft using slide rules without the aid of computing without the aid of uh, you know the kind of advancements and, and processing power that we have today and they designed it with 6 million moving parts in 28 months and then it took less than a year, a year more for the man, for the engineers, for the mechanics, for the plant to actually assemble the first 747. So in three years, you went from uh, starting the design to actually having the prototype fly. And if you think about the situation in the world today, where you know famously, as I had stated in one of my previous episodes, even to get a slight change to the website or to your boarding pass, you need three months. You know, I don't know whether we've progressed or we've regressed when you could design and build the 747 from scratch with no computing power in three years. So the aircraft eventually flew, finally flew in 1969. And, and uh, I should mention that uh, in order to produce the aircraft, Boeing had to build a new plant because the existing factory plants uh, could not accommodate the scale of the 747. So they identified a new spot about 50 kilometers north of Seattle called Everett. And they built what is still the largest uh, enclosed space in the world the Everett uh, assembly line, and the 747 was built there. So off, starting 1966, not only did they start designing the aircraft, but Boeing had to actually get hold of land and build an entire assembly plant, the largest building in the world, still the largest still today, and have that ready in time to start producing the aircraft within two years. And, you know, when you again think about the fact that the MAX, which has, um, you know, seen several challenges, has been grounded for more than a year, a year and a half now, Actually, it's, it's been a year since it's been grounded. Um, and by the time it flies, maybe two years. To fix a couple of design flaws in the MAX is taking the company almost two years. When 50 years ago, they designed the 747 in 28 months. So it is just a mind-boggling achievement. And I just wanted to you know, use this episode to just marvel at the genius, the dedication, the passion, and the sheer brilliance of Joe Sutter and his team and of Boeing at that time to be able to pull together this magnificent aircraft, the most complex mechanical thing ever built in such a short period of time with no modern design tools. So again, here's to you the 747, uh, my favorite aircraft by far, uh, you know, wherever, it, in whichever part of the world, if one saw the 747, one would stop to look at it. It was attention grabbing. It was iconic. Even the most jaded traveler would stop to look at the 747. It symbolized really the advent of global mass travel. It made the world a smaller place and it flew for 50 years. And the latest version, the 747-8i, will fly for a few more years. Its uh, passenger versions of that are being uh, operated by Lufthansa, uh, by Korean Air, by Air China. So if you happen to have the opportunity, though that's where you can fly the latest version for a few more years. But I'm really sad to see that the 400s are all now history, that uh, it will not be a common sight anymore in the world. There was a period, uh, you know, in the in the 80s and 90s when Heathrow Airport or Los Angeles or uh, Narita, Hong Kong, etc. were just 747 cities and that site will not be seen anymore. But in here, anyway, here's to you, Boeing, and here's to you, 747. What a magnificent aircraft and thank you for you know, giving all of us Av geeks such a wonderful memory and such a wonderful aircraft to talk about. And I wish it a very happy retirement, uh, except for the 747-8s, which hopefully will be around for a few years more. So that's it for today. Take care and see you next time. Bye.